It's 9, it's Friday, the sun is shining, it's about to be a long weekend, um, which is a reminder that Monday there will not be lecture, so you're welcome to come and do a study group, but I won't be here, so that's completely up to you. Wednesday next week we'll talk about pox viruses and vaccines, and I will have a whole bunch of clicker questions for you, which is exactly what you want. Yes, I know. Uh, so that is, it's a nice way to sort of review some of the stuff from here. Um, our guest lecturer today is George Kaysen, a PhD student in my lab working on single-stranded DNA viruses, and I think he's going to talk a little bit about some of his work. And without any further ado, George. All right. So, probably don't quite have full lecture here that you guys are used to. Um, I'll try to go through it slowly, try not to confuse you, try not to confuse myself, which may be the, the more important thing. Um, if you have questions, just get my attention and I will do my best to answer your question. If I don't have an answer to your question, I'll, luckily we have Dr. Stedman here and we can ask him. So, oh, no, I do. <laughs> so, so today, we are just going to go through kind of a, a typical lecture that you guys have from Dr. Stedman following the same format, and we're going to talk about small single-stranded DNA viruses. So small both because they have small virions and small because they have relatively small genomes. So we'll talk about um, single-stranded DNA, yeah? Is it normally positive or negative-stranded? So these are, well, we'll talk about, we'll get to that and you'll see, you'll see how that works. Um, so we'll talk about um, parvoviruses, which are single-stranded DNA viruses that um, are not circular. Uh, we'll go through their structure, how they get into cells. Um, we'll hopefully do a little bit of review about what it means to be a susceptible versus a permissive cell. We'll talk about transcription, proteins. We'll look at how they replicate their genomes. Um, you guys have probably, in other classes, talked about how cells or maybe viruses deal with replicating the ends of DNA. So we'll talk about how these specific viruses replicate the ends of their DNA. Um, we'll look at why these particular viruses are dependent on the cell cycle, particularly being in S phase. Um, we'll look at some examples of what are known as dependoviruses that require infection by another virus to actually um, replicate. We'll look at autonomous viruses, and we'll briefly talk about some applications of these single-stranded DNA viruses. Yeah. Are the viruses the same as satellite virus in this case, then? Synonymous, or are they different? Different is my understanding. Similar, but different. Okay. And then we'll talk about um, some more small single-stranded DNA viruses that we work on in our lab. These are the actual single-stranded DNA viruses with circular genomes. We'll talk briefly about genome structure, replication, where they come from, and maybe a little bit about who they're infecting, potentially. Okay, so briefly, origins, where do these small single-stranded DNA viruses come from? Well, if you inject lab rodents, mice, with tumor material, and then you screen for viruses, what comes out? Well, a lot of times it's these small single-stranded DNA viruses. And you could make the assumption that because you injected these rodents with tumor material, the viruses that you get out are oncogenic, right? Oncogenic, meaning they give rise to tumors, give rise to cancer. It turns out that they actually aren't oncogenic, at least not in the case of parvoviruses. They are what you would call oncotrophic. So they, like we said, they have a need for the S phase of the cell cycle in order to um, replicate their genomes. So they have a need on the proteins that are present during replication of cells. Um, and so they aren't oncogenic, they're oncotrophic. Um, we'll go through in a little while about how they are potentially oncolytic, meaning they could potentially be used as a tool for um, fighting cancer. Yeah? Sorry, just to make a distinction clear between oncotrophic and oncogenic. Would oncogenic mean like they, they always cause some kind of cancer while in the course of reproduction and oncotrophic? Means Not necessarily always, okay. but onco, cancer, genic, beginning giving rise to cancer, yeah. Um, so 
a couple examples. Um, we briefly talked about autonomous versus dependo viruses. We have the parvoviruses, um, the one that you guys are probably, or at least some of you are familiar with if you've had young dogs, puppies, is the canine parvovirus. You can imagine why that would be prevalent in puppies, given that you now know that these viruses are dependent on rapidly dividing cells. And then the other one that we'll look at, um, the example for dependoviruses that we have is AAV, which is the adeno-associated virus. Have you guys talked about adenoviruses yet this quarter? So you guys are probably familiar with adenovirus. Okay, so the structure um, solved through cryo-EM, I believe. Um, T equals one naked icosahedral capsid from 60 subunits. Since you guys have all taken Dr. Stedman's tests, you know that he likes comparisons. You know that he likes asking questions um, or you have to really put your knowledge to work. So from that T equals one, you can probably at least think about, hopefully figure out your H and K values. Um, small, again, small virions, 28 nanometers in diameter. So some of the smallest viruses that infect animals, coming from the Latin word for small, parvus. Um, in this case, they have a five kilobase, in quotes, linear single-stranded DNA genome, and we'll see why that linear is in quotes here in a little bit. Um, Small hint, they have extensive secondary structures with hairpin ends, so those give rise to kind of a, a pseudo um, nonlinear structure. They typically encode three to seven proteins. Um, based on this, on cryo-EM data, there's density associated with the inside of the capsid proteins. Generally, when you see density through cryo-EM associated with viral capsid proteins, you can assume that the DNA is ordered in some way inside the virion or is associated with those, some of those capsid proteins inside, inside the virion. So how do these viruses get into cells? Well, it's kind of the same story that you guys have heard probably for most of the viruses this quarter, at least a lot of them. So minute virus of mice, which is an autonomous single-stranded DNA virus, gets in through gets into the cell, at least via sialic acid, on the, um, the membranes of the cells. And so other viruses that get into cells via sialic acid, you can probably think of at least a handful that you've learned about this quarter. Um, adeno-associated viruses, you have a whole list there. Those probably don't, aren't truly important for our purposes, but again, typical ways that viruses get into cells. Um, so once these viruses get into the cell, the entire virion, capsid still intact, is taken to the nucleus and gets into the nucleus via endocytosis. So that makes the uncoding stage, once you're actually inside the nucleus, the critical step, right? So you can potentially get into these cells as a virus, but you need to be, or these viruses need to be able to then get into the nucleus and uncoat. Because again, single-stranded DNA viruses, you're dependent on cellular DNA replication proteins, cellular DNA replication machinery. Where is all that stuff? In the nucleus. So just a, a brief review that kind of um, comes from that discussion. Um, cells with the correct extracellular receptors, so back on that previous slide, sialic acid, Cells with the, those correct receptors that allow viruses to enter the cell are called susceptible cells. So if the virus can get into the cell, that cell is susceptible. If the cells have the correct machinery, correct proteins, they're able to recognize that viral DNA and able to replicate it, those cells would then be called permissive. So for a successful, what we call natural infection, the cell needs to be both susceptible and permissive. So the virus needs to be able to get into the cell, in this case, get into the nucleus, and then replicate its genome there. So again, in the case of our small single-stranded DNA viruses, particularly the parvovirus, um, the canine parvovirus, again, which infects puppies, can get into, enter 
feline cat cells, but it's not going to replicate. So we would call feline cells susceptible because the virus is able to enter the cell, but they are non-permissive because the virus, the viral genome isn't actually able to replicate. It's not able to get into the nucleus. Whereas if you simply transform naked viral DNA into feline cells, naked parvovirus DNA into feline cells, you can get um, replication of that genome. Is that something to do with cat cells? So it's the relationship between the virus and the nucleus. Again, cat cells, dog cells, different, different oh, right, nucleus right. structures. Yeah. I think that it's the second, yeah. There, I don't know of any, off the top of my head, single-stranded DNA viruses that specifically infect cats. I'm sure they exist, though. So it, it's the, the, uh, the uncoding at the nucleus that, that is the, the limiting step here. So just from that, canine parvovirus can enter both permissive, permissive and non-permissive cells. But again, you have to be susceptible to have a successful infection take place or a successful replication of that genome production of more virus particles. So how are these genomes organized? Um, again, they're small, few, relatively few genes um, that are produced, that produce proteins via lots of splicing. So if you guys have talked about, or I'm pretty sure you guys have talked about other viruses both RNA and DNA that use splicing. Um, RNA virus uses lots of splicing. Have you guys talked about one yet? Yeah. Which one? <laughs> what about DNA viruses that use lots of splicing? So that would probably be a good, I don't know if you've already been <laughs> tested on that, but that's a good Stedman question, right? <laughs> And then, so you can see the alternative splicing here. Then down at the bottom, you have um, one example of an alternative start codon. Um, kind of typical organization, you have the non-structural proteins that mediate replication located on the left or five prime half of the genome. Then you have the structural capsid proteins located on, um, located on the three prime right half of the genome. And you have, um, I just boxed your, your promoters there. So in the case of the minute virus of mice, you only have two promoters. Um, in the case of adeno-associated virus, you have three. And we'll look at um, how those promoters function a little bit later. So this is genome structure. So I m mentioned previously linear was in quotes. And this is why linear was in quotes, because you don't have a covalently closed genome, but you do have extensive secondary structures. So you have the loops here, you have complementarity here through the three prime end. So these loops at the end are your terminal hairpins, and this three prime end here, if you guys think to molecular biology, um, what do you need for DNA replication to take place? You need a free 3 prime OH, which in this case, and we'll come back to this, this free 3 prime end here provides. So these, these genomes are both self-priming, and then they also serve as a template for replication. And these terminal hairpins, as we'll see, help solve um, the problem of how do you replicate DNA ends. So I just mentioned the genome then serves both as a template for replication, so your template and serves as a primer, so your three prime OH. So what happens first? Once this is in the nucleus, you can have cellular DNA polymerases extending from that free three prime OH provided by the virus. You get extension out through the end here, which as you can see breaks down these um, terminal hairpins. So what is, what would double-stranded DNA be used for in the nucleus? Uh, 
maybe that's an ambiguous question. What, what, what besides, what, what besides replication is DNA used for, I guess? Yeah, transcription. So in order to have transcription take place, you need double-stranded DNA. And we'll come back to, to kind of this, this issue later as to potentially why, why would a virus maintain a single-stranded DNA genome. Okay, so once you have conversion from that single-stranded genome to your double-stranded um, form, using that, again, that 3 prime OH, you can have, in red, cellular transcription factors that bind to your viral promoters. So in the red boxes, E2F, SP1, you have your TADA binding protein down there. Those are all ubiquitous, very common transcriptional regulators. Um, and in green, you have NS1, which we'll see later, is the protein that mediates replication as far as, um, or is the protein provided by the virus that mediates replication. And again, our uh, alternative start code on there for the VP2 versus VP3. Again, lots of splicing and an example of an alternative start codon usage. Then you have cellular and viral transcription factors that give rise to um, the necessary proteins to make new, new virus particles. Okay, so once you've made that double-stranded form that's capable of giving rise to mRNA, it's now time to replicate your genome and move on to a new cell, potentially. So again, DNA end replication provides, or is a, a problem, right, in linear, at least, DNA fragments. So classic example in eukaryotic cells, you have RNA primers that prime DNA replication. So you have your template strand here. RNA primer binds. DNA polymerase makes new DNA strands. You can remove the RNA primers. And then what you have here, again, is another free, this time, DNA free 3 prime OH. You can fill in that gap. Down here at your terminal end, you don't have a 3 prime OH primer to fill in from. So eukaryotic cells use telomerase, reverse transcriptase to deal with this problem at the very ends. Um, do you guys, can you think of another way to deal with replicating DNA ends? That we've talked about? Circularized Yeah, you can just get rid, of, get rid of your ends. You don't have any ends to replicate. If you're a circular, Genome, that's one way. The other way, or one of the other ways that we'll talk about now is having these hairpins. Okay, so in the case of adeno-associated viruses, again, you have um, extension from this free 3 prime OH. Again, that's a DNA primer, priming DNA replication. Down here at the five prime end, you have the NS1, or the rep protein associated with the 5 prime end of the genome, likely associated with the 5 prime end of the genome. So you get extension, you get the breakdown of the hairpin at the 5 prime end, and then this rep protein that was associated with the original 5 prime end dissociates there and rebinds just opposite of this original 3 prime end on the opposite strand. So moving from this three prime end binds just opposite on the other strand, and it introduces a nick. And so a nick is a, a single-stranded DNA break. Um, so from there, you have an S1 rep protein that unwinds through helicase activity. It'll unwind both your hairpin, it'll have your strands pulled apart, it, may, it stays associated with that, what is now a five prime end of the genome. So in, it, within the rep is a three prime OH um, mimic. So the tyrosine residue, if you think back to, again, back to biochemistry, molecular biology, remember that tyrosines have that OH 
So the OH stays associated with uh, the five prime end of the genome. Um, once you get those separated, you can simply extend back across and you wind up with these progeny genomes that can then be packaged. Um, as far as I know, it's the, so backing way back to the beginning when we looked at the, the structure, we talked briefly about um, seeing density associated on the inside of capsid proteins, which hints at um, an ordered DNA molecule being inside those capsid proteins. It's my understanding that this rep protein is likely interacting with capsid proteins as opposed to the DNA, which mediates the encapsidation of this genome. Um, and so in my opinion, it's kind of important to notice what the rep protein of these viruses does and doesn't do. The name, at least at first glance, implies potentially that it's mediating or performing replication when in fact all it really does is do some nicking and potentially some unwinding of DNA. Then it's the cellular DNA polymerases that actually polymerize or make new virus genomes. Um, and then the last thing to note is, so you have these regions here, the A, B, and C. Actually, I think it's easier to see it here. So when you replicate these terminal hairpins, um, each time you do so, you get an inversion of these sequences. And you can see that down here. It's hard to explain how that happens if you draw out the replication by hand and actually write the sequences, you'll be able to see um, why that happens, just as a function of complementarity. Okay, so we know that now, or we now know that the NS1 or the rep protein nicks DNA, it can unwind DNA. Um, what else can it do? Well, it can also bind promoters, so we saw that earlier. It um, is a transcriptional activator. Um, it can bind ATP, has ATPase activity, which drives its helicase activity, which unwinds those terminal hairpins, pulls those strands apart. Um, we know that it's a specific endonuclease because it can introduce that sequence-specific nick just opposite that original 3'OH. Um, we saw that it's a transcriptional activator. It's also a cell cycle blocker, so it can bind to cellular promoters and keep cells in the S phase, right? Because we, or these viruses need cells to be in the S phase. They don't want them advancing out of the S phase because during the S phase is when you have the necessary cellular proteins to mediate um, replication. And then back from the previous side, slide, we also saw that it can be packaged in the virion. And you just have down below um, your your domains here. So coiled coil, zinc finger, kind of your classic DNA binding motifs, NTP binding, so that would be for your um, binding ATP, resultant ATP ACE activity, and then finally just a nuclear localization signal, because as we know, everything having to do with these viruses has to happen in the nucleus. Okay, so those are by far and large examples of the autonomous single-stranded DNA viruses. We can look, um, if you look at these in terms of being infected at the same time, or look at the cell in terms of being infected at the same time with something like um, adenovirus and adeno-associated virus, in that case we could call the adenovirus a helper virus because the adeno-associated viruses lack the ability to drive the cell cycle into the S phase. So adenovirus during a co-infection helps the adeno-associated virus by providing viral proteins as well as um, kind of kicking the cell into S phase. So how does this normally happen in the healthy normal cell? You have your cyclin-dependent kinases that phosphorylate RB. RB dissociates from E2F. E2F leads to transcription, so it's just your, your common, a common transcription factor. 
Once you have active E2F, you can get, get into S phase. Um, if you have adenovirus infection, adenovirus protein E1A will sequester RB from this complex, leaving E2F um, free to push the cells into the S phase. Um, so those are, or the E1A is what the helper viruses provide as far as um, stimulating the cell cycle. They also have proteins that stimulate E1B, E4 that stimulate nuclear transport of those dependoviruses. And finally, uh, the RNA from VA gene blocks, blocks your PKR. So if there's no helper virus present, so if there's no adenovirus present, AAV can potentially integrate into the genome. So if, um, if you're unable as AAV to replicate your genome, move on to a new cell because the particular cell isn't in S phase, there's a potential for AAV to integrate. And the mechanism behind this isn't, as far as I know, isn't fully understood. Um, so you get the replication of the first strand. We saw that, the extension from that free 3 prime OH. And then um, integration is likely mediated by, again, the NS1, the rep protein, and probably cellular endonucleases as well. So this slide, okay. So you can also use these types of viruses as anti-tumor agents. So we briefly talked at the beginning, that originally they were believed to potentially be um, oncogenic because they were isolated from tumor material. It actually turns out again that they are simply dependent on rapidly dividing cells. Um, so how would you potentially use, use these viruses as anti-tumor agents? Well, NS1, toxic to cells, so you could potentially express, if you're expressing NS1 in rapidly dividing cells, potentially, um, eventually you'll get some cell death that way. Um, the single-stranded DNA nature of these viruses elicits the DNA damage response, um, which leads to the arrest of the cell cycle, which in the case of a cancer cell would be a desirable outcome, and you can get um, programmed cell death. Because these genomes are small, they're also relatively easy to manipulate. Manipulate. So you, if you have your favorite anti-cancer product or gene that you are interested in, you could potentially use recombinant DNA techniques, technologies to um, make adeno-associated viruses particularly express a particular gene, particular protein in tumor cancer cells as a means for um, therapy, yeah. And the reason you'd only get the NS1 in the cancer cells is because they need those rapidly dividing cells so they'd be... Right, yeah, so the hope is is that the, the, um, the ability of the cell or the ability of the virus to infect other cells is minimal because it's so heavily dependent on um, the presence of the S phase or rapidly dividing cells. So you would hope that your off-target effects or infections is, is minimized due to that. Okay, so kind of the, the key concepts for the linear single-stranded DNA viruses. Um, saw how hairpin ends are partially used to solve the DNA end replication problem. Um, we briefly talked about the difference between susceptible and permissive cells and how cells that are susceptible cannot necessarily be or aren't necessarily permissive um, due to, at least in the case of these viruses, the need to get into the nucleus. We talked about why these viruses are dependent on the S phase and we briefly looked at um, integration of particularly adeno-associated viruses when they don't have co-infection with an adenovirus or a helper virus. Okay, so those are small, single-stranded, linear DNA viruses of 
animals. So we'll briefly talk now about true circular small single-stranded DNA viruses. Um, we'll focus on the circle viruses, which are viruses of animals. And we'll talk about, again, genome structure replication origins, particularly of virus that we work on in our lab, the small single-stranded DNA virus that we work on in our lab. So porcine circoviruses are kind of um, the most at least economically important circovirus that I'm aware of. So circoviruses infect pigs, they infect birds, um, all kinds of animals. If we back up a slide here, so the circoviruses infect animals, Gemini viruses infect plants. I don't know if you guys have had your plant virus lecture yet, but you'll probably talk about Gemini viruses at some point. No, you won't. <laughs> Just kidding. You will not talk about Gemini viruses. So again, very small. So you have your electron micrograph here. Very small virus particles, virions. Um, again, their genomes are some of the most reduced viral genomes. So literally all you have in this porcine circovirus genome is an open reading frame encoding the capsid protein. And you have, again, a rep protein, similar to what we saw for the parvoviruses. And then you have an origin of replication, which is just a DNA structure, secondary structure. So I said, I mentioned previously that these are an econom relatively economically important disease. They cause a post-weaning disease in young pigs. And you, so you, down below you have example of kind of the, the black spots that, these, um, that this virus causes. Okay, so how is circovirus replication mediated? Um, again, the viral protein that's necessary is the rep protein. Um, when you look at the rep protein in infected, cultured, um, porcine pig cells, you find two distinct rep transcripts that are found. So down below you can see the splicing event that leads to those two um, rep transcripts being found. They seem to have the same in vitro function, and we'll talk about what this function is in a minute. Um, there's three domains. You have domain one, two, and three. Those are necessary for DNA nicking and joining, similar to the rep protein that we talked about earlier, NS1. And then you have the S3H motif that's probably necessary for DNA binding and likely mediates winding and unwinding. The reason I say likely is that, um, as far as I know, it hasn't been shown that these proteins, at least in the circoviruses, um, are actually capable of that, that helicase activity. Um, and that helicase activity, that NTP activity, NTPase activity, is likely harbored by what's known as the P loop. Um, and so here, this is just briefly showing that one of the functions that these proteins serve is nicking of single stranded DNA. So if you nick, single-stranded DNA, you will wind up with two, right, two separate distinct pieces of DNA. So if you start with a 61 nucleotide piece of DNA that comprises um, the origin of replication, some other important structures and sequences, and you expose that DNA to either, either one of these, either rep, rep prime proteins, you end up with, um, with nicking activity, which you can see by the appearance of this smaller sized fragment here. Okay, so we talked about how those linear genomes are replicated. Linear single-stranded DNA genomes were replicated via the hairpin ends and the self-priming. Um, so we'll briefly talk now about how linear, or sorry, how small single-stranded circular DNA viruses are replicated through one method, which is rolling circle replication, which is also um, present in plasmids. You may have talked about it in other classes. So the infecting DNA, again, this all happens in the nucleus in the case of um, these circoviruses. 
you have infecting, you can just barely make it out, the infecting DNA zero, which is single-stranded, is somehow converted to double-stranded form. And from that double-stranded form, you get your protein or your mRNA production. How this is converted to double-stranded isn't entirely clear, at least what the primer, um, what the primer is isn't clear. This conversion to double-stranded is, again, mediated by your host DNA polymerases. So there's kind of a lot of stuff going on here. So you can, um, well, so once you have conversion to your double-stranded form, I was going to say you can ignore this, but I guess it's slightly important. Um, you have supercoiling that takes place. And so these genomes are likely supercoiled um, until you get association of this rep protein. And again, those helicase, that proposed helicase activity may help in relaxing some of that supercoiling. But what truly, or what's definitely known, is that you get rep binding to a specific sequence, and a specific structure, and it will introduce its single-stranded nicking. So you get nicking right here at the origin, and then again, just like we saw with the linear genomes, this rep protein stays associated with the five prime end of the genome because again, it has a tyrosine doing the nicking, and it likely unwinds or separates these strands, and cellular DNA polymerases can do their job. So you get replication all the way around, all the way around. And then at the other end, or at the conclusion of replication, after you've completed one full cycle, there's a couple um, different hypotheses as to how these genomes again separate, but the important things are that this rep protein mediates the joining of the old genome. So the old genome here, once you get this rep mediated joining, it's free to dissociate. You have the rep protein staying associated with the newly replicated genome, where it can again introduce its NIC, and you get the whole process happening again. So. In this case, how do you deal with DNA end replication? Well, you just don't have DNA ends. So this is maybe a slightly more clear picture of single strand or of circular single stranded DNA replication, specifically rolling circle replication. So again, you're infecting DNA, somehow converted to double stranded DNA. You have your rep protein, the red arrow, nicking in a sequence and structure dependent manner. It stays associated. You make your new blue genome associated with the old genome. You get the sealing, and then it, may, or it remains associated with your new blue genome there. So we don't work on circoviruses directly in our lab, so why are we? interested in circoviruses. So starting at the beginning, um, so one of our favorite places to work is Lassen Volcanic National Park. This is where we find viruses of archaea. Dr. Stedman's lab has traditionally worked on, and those of you that are in, um, I can't remember the number, but in recombinant DNA techniques or advanced molecular biology, whatever the name of it is now. Viruses from hell. That one. <laughs> You guys are familiar with uh, the archaeal viruses that we work with. Unfortunately, That's the last subject's lecture for this term will also be the archaeal viruses. So this might be a little deceiving. The archaeal viruses don't actually come from, from um, this lake here, which is Boiling Springs Lake, but they do come from over the hill here. Um, so what is Boiling Springs Lake? It's Lake in Lassen Volcanic National Park. So we're up here. Here's Redding, California, just about an hour or two east of Redding, California. Um, so Boiling Springs Lake is a low pH, high temperature, so pH of around 3, temperature of 50 to 90 C. Um, and it's a purely microbial lake. You have life from 
all three domains. And what we're interested in are viruses. So, yeah, let's go figure, huh? <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Stedman's former PhD student, Jeff Diemer, I guess Dr. Diemer, um, studied the viral makeup of Boiling Springs Lake. So he did this through metaviromic, metagenomic te techniques where you extract DNA. In our case, you size exclude cells. So you extract, um, hopefully, viral only DNA. And you sequence all that DNA and you put everything back together and you say, what kind of viruses are there? So we have lots of DNA viruses, makes sense. We extracted DNA, or they, he, extracted and sequenced DNA. But here, down this big green arrow, for some reason, we're finding sequences that look like sequences that you only find in RNA viruses. So as the story goes, Jeff brought this to Dr. Stedman. Dr. Stedman was skeptical and said, recheck this. And so Jeff, Dr. Diemer, rechecked this, came up with the same results, um, that yeah, I'm still finding a virus that looks like it should be an RNA virus in my DNA data. So what they did was they designed primers based on the sequences that they had, and they were able to amplify a full virus genome. So moving from your metaviromic data to an actual, I guess physical may not be the correct word, but to an actual virus genome that you can manipulate, that you can observe. And so when you um, look at this virus genome, what's in it? Well, there's a circovirus like rep protein, which is why we are somewhat interested in circoviruses. But strangely enough, the capsid protein for these viruses is most similar to capsid proteins found in Thombus viruses. So what are Thombus viruses? Thombus viruses are single-stranded RNA viruses that infect plants. So this is a really interesting problem, question as to what is a Thombus virus-like capsid protein doing in an RNA, or sorry, in a DNA virus? And so then, up at the top, you have a stem loop or an origin that looks similar in structure and sequence. On the next slide, we'll see that to what you see in circoviruses. And then finally, there are two open reading frames that don't have any homology any significant um, homology to anything in public databases. That's actually, at this point, not true, but I don't know if I believe the, the, al the alignments aren't significant enough for me to believe them. And so, the yeah, yeah, yeah. So we don't know what these are, is the takeaway. <laughs> um, and so you can access this paper. It's open access here. Um, Again, yeah, so, so we're at something like 49,000, 48,000, or they're at 48, 49,000 accesses, which is pretty impressive for, um, for a paper. So you guys should get us to 50,000. Yeah. <laughs> so again, those stem loop structures. So I've mentioned that the rep protein nicks in a structure and sequence dependent manner. So this is the structure and the sequence of porcine circovirus on the left and of what we're calling the Boiling Springs Lake RNA-DNA hybrid virus, RDHV. Um, that name is probably not quite applicable anymore. Um, so now these viruses are being called cruciviruses. Um, cruci meaning cross, kind of an intersection of RNA and DNA. So one thing that I think, now that I'm up here talking, that I think some people get confused about is that this genome is actually all DNA. So this open reading frame, DNA, 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 DNA. There's no RNA in the actual viral genome. It's just that this DNA sequence, when you translate it, looks like the translated sequence of an RNA capsid protein.
and so I have, I have a picture of the paper here. So again, another shameless plug to, to access this paper. So how would a virus like this arise? Well, it likely happened during a co-infection event between a single-stranded RNA virus, a single-stranded DNA virus in the same cell. And so what you in some way have is, so you have your, your red rep protein here, your circovirus-like rep protein. You have your original capsid protein here, which would have been predictably, I guess, likely a capsid protein that was probably um, similar to typical capsid proteins in DNA viruses, potentially, I guess. Somehow, at some point, um, this virus genome integrated an RNA capsid. So our working hypothesis is that at some point you probably did have, or you could have potentially had, DNA here and an RNA, potentially an mRNA capsid here. You get reverse transcription, and now you have, again, your DNA-like, your, your circovirus-like rep protein. You have your DNA virus-like capsid protein. Now you have a DNA copy of an RNA capsid protein. But having two capsid proteins is redundant. There's a cost associated with having more nucleic acid, more of a genome than you really need, so at some point, through a gene deletion, this DNA capsid protein was likely lost, which results in simply having a, again, a DNA copy of an RNA capsid protein. So how does this RNA capture actually happen? Well, one way that it could happen is maybe it serves as the primer moving from your single-stranded genome to your double-stranded copy. Perhaps, perhaps you have integration at that point. Um, maybe it serves as your primer here. So remember, you get this nicking activity. Maybe it serves as a it served as a primer for making your new blue genome strand. Perhaps it becomes associated with the rep protein at some point during during replication of your new blue genome strand there. Perhaps it somehow became incorporated during that um, joining or sealing event at the end. And so this is what I work on as I'm trying to um, kind of do the biochemical characterization of this protein, see um, can it act on RNA in any way. And that's kind of the point of my PhD project. So, these mechanisms from the previous slide are laid out in, I think this is from 2015, 2014, 2013. At any rate, it's laid out in Dr. Sedman's paper here. So you can read this paper for a more detailed description of, of potentially how an, a DNA virus could <coughs> incorporate a gene from a RNA virus. Yeah. Can we access this on one of the library da databases, or where would we? If you just Google grant theft RNA, uh, <laughs> it comes up, and you should be able to access it. Okay. If not, I can send you a copy of your Make paper. sure you're on the PSU cool. network. So there's another paper that I forgot to include here, which is Dr. Studman's review of single-stranded like, or single-stranded DNA viruses popping up in um, eukaryotic genomes, which also he also lays out a couple more, I can't remember if they're distinct or different, but a couple um, methods by which this recombination could happen in that paper. That's a review article. So since Dr. Sedman and Dr. Diemer published their paper, other groups have become interested, so I guess I'll back up. So there was a paper published, I think, in 2010, in which they looked at... Um, kind of the metavirome of air. <laughs> so you bubble air through some sort of liquid water. Um, you collect the DNA from that water, sequence it, and you can extrapolate back. All well, these viruses were probably present in air. So they did more or less the same thing that 
Dr. Stedman and Deemer did in Boiling Springs Lake, but for air in Korea. And they found um, a similar virus, except they discounted this virus as being incorrect data. So they didn't follow up on it. If you look at their paper, they have kind of an asterisk or question mark next to, um, next to the RNA that they found in their DNA metavirome. But since then, what's happened is that other groups have been able to find these, what at this time were being called chimeric viruses. They're now being called cruci viruses. They've been able to find these viruses in both new and old metaviromic data sets. Um, and there's a couple examples now of, I think probably six or seven examples of these virus genomes actually being able to be fully amplified using traditional PCR out of, out of their environments. So what you find when you look at these um, cruci viruses, again, cross kind of an intersection between RNA and DNA, is that the rep protein is from various single-stranded DNA viruses. So circoviruses, Gemini viruses, um, nanoviruses, you have a whole wide array of rep proteins. However, as of now, all the capsid <coughs> proteins that have been found are homologous to Thombus viruses. So if you do um, your phylogenetic relationships, the capsid proteins form monophyletic groups, which suggests that there was one, likely one event of recombination between an RNA and a DNA virus in which the DNA virus acquired that RNA capsid protein. And then subsequently you had rearrangement of the different rep proteins between Gemini viruses, um, circoviruses, so on. Okay, so brings us almost to the end. So why would a virus want, or what's the evolutionary advantage of maintaining, I don't want to say want, don't want to anthropomorphize too much, but why, why do viruses or any organism, organism for that matter, maintain single-stranded DNA? It seems, right, that single-stranded DNA would be at a disadvantage. It's a great target to be chewed up, right? If you're outside the nucleus and you're a single-stranded nucleic acid or you're a single-stranded DNA, your life, your half-life, is going to be very short, right? There's all kinds of stuff inside cells to chew up single-stranded DNA. Seems cumbersome to go from a single-stranded DNA to a double-stranded intermediate so that you can make proteins, right? So it seems at least on the surface that Maybe single-stranded DNA is an evolutionarily inefficient way to exist. Well, potentially, hopefully, our research will be able to show that single-stranded DNA, particularly single-stranded DNA viruses, possess some kind of mechanism that allows them to undergo, if at the very least, heavy recombination with each other. So when you have that happening, you can broaden your host range quickly, you can explore new hosts quickly, um, and potentially maybe they harbor some kind of mechanism that would allow them to also recombine with RNA viruses. Again, if you can sample host ranges, you can avoid or evade host defenses, avoid the immune system, so on. Yeah? Do we see any viruses either RNA or DNA that have these any mechanisms similar to this that, are, that you guys are looking for, particularly in circoviruses? So the circovirus rep protein has been well characterized. The RDHV rep protein has not been well characterized, so I'm working on characterizing it. So the circovirus rep protein is easier to work with than the protein that I'm working with. So we're going to be doing the same experiments, hopefully in parallel, um, just with different rep proteins. I don't know if that answers your question. So as of now, we're not aware of any rep proteins that are able to mediate literal DNA 
RNA joining, nicking, and then subsequent joining, but we are, we're looking at a wide range of these proteins. So it'd be a completely novel mechanism in terms of viruses? As far as I know, yeah. There are examples of <coughs> things like uh, DNA ligase can somewhat inefficiently do DNA, RNA, I think, like the T4 ligase. Okay, so the RNA-DNA hybrid virus, which at this point is probably more appropriate to call a circovirus. We talked about um, the one that Dr. Stedman's lab originally found in Boiling Springs Lake. Um, we talked about the difference between replicating a circular single-stranded DNA genome using the rolling circle mechanism versus those linear genomes that we talked about earlier. And then we talked about potentially some RNA capture methods and why, why those could be evolutionarily important and pretty novel. So that's, that's all I have. I guess the timing is not too bad. Is it like nine, almost 10? So if you guys have questions, comments, concerns, more than welcome to ask and I'll hang out for a while and try to answer questions. Or just now, because people have questions, probably more than one. Yeah. I'm um, going back to the NSO genome. Is it integrated into the genome? Does it sit in a lysogenic state? Does it require a co-infection to actually enter the F phase? Or is the co-infection necessary? So my understanding is that you only, or you increase your likelihood of integration when you don't have infection with one of your helper viruses. I don't know how a subsequent infection with a helper virus would affect the integrated virus. Yeah, I don't know about excision. I'm not sure if there's any evidence that once you're integrated with that connection, then like in the case of lambda, give you some kind of induction. I don't think that happens, but I, I could be wrong. Yeah. So if I'm going to back up here. This is going to give somebody a headache, so don't watch. <laughs> so the, there. So the autonomous viruses have ways to push the cell into S phase. So this E1A protein, which binds RB or sequesters RB, whatever you want to say, allows E2F then to do its job. Part of E2F's job is pushing the cell into S phase. So they don't sit and wait necessarily, but they do have methods of pushing the cell. Isn't that NS1, I think, in some of the, like the minute viruses in mice, I think it also has some of that activity. I'm not entirely sure, but it does seem to be, if you don't have, again, like the canine parvo parvovirus, that does seem to be able to extend the cell cycle. Yeah. Yes. That's probably also one of the things you're asking about in terms of the specificity and the permissivity Would make sense, right? Because it has a whole bunch of DNA binding motifs. We know that it can act as a transcriptional regulator, at least on um, viral promoters. So by extension, it would probably make sense of it. Yeah. Are you thinking that the RNA capture takes place in any kind of way similar to strand capture between hybridizing strands um, the way homologous recombination takes place, or I mean, I guess I think if I think you look at it. But. So right now we're kind of operating under the assumption. So again, don't look that it's. So we know that at least where is it? There it is. So. That nicking and joining activity is dependent on both the structure and the sequence found in DNA. And so we're thinking if you can mimic this DNA structure and sequence in RNA, perhaps rep protein, I want to say can't tell the difference, but in a probably in a much re reduced, with a much reduced efficiency, can act on RNA in a similar manner to the way it acts on DNA.
Thanks, George. All right.